Hello everyone and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast and today I'm joined by producer and composer Paul McGeekin. Hello Paul. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Um, we're going to talk mainly about uh, the new Starless album Earthbound, which is out now, I believe, on last night from Glasgow. It is indeed, it came out just the tail end of May there, so yeah. Um, so there's a lot I'd like to discuss with you, Paul, but let's start off with Starless. Could you explain yeah. how it came about and how the project, for want of a better word, works? Okay, well, uh, it's, it's kind of been a long process. Uh, as I think you know, I, I was in numerous bands through my career, and then uh, when the last band I was in, Love and Money, or the main band I was in towards the end of my career, uh, when that stopped, I really got into production and engineering, working with other artists, and kind of got out the, the way of performance so forth uh, and writing myself. And then Love and Money reformed uh, for a, a number of shows, I think it was about nine years ago, I think. I can't believe yeah. it's that long, but, uh, and then that kind of got me into, I had to learn to play again, I hadn't played for years. And, oh, okay. So I bought a keyboard again and kind of, I just got, got into it. And I'd had a solo or a project in mind when I ran a studio Park Lane, uh, but I had, and lots of people had signed up to do that, but I had an accident and then I couldn't play after that. So after Love and Money Reform, it kind of got me interested again and it just what came from there. And I worked on ideas and my friend David Scott, we traveled to work together quite a lot and he had to listen to the various <laughs> ideas for a while, poor guy. But, uh, and then, you know, it just came together through time uh, and just trying different things until I kind of felt I was getting where I wanted to go. So, yeah. It's a very uh, collaborative project, of course. Well, it's, it's a collaborative project. It's a solo project, but it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's the biggest solo and project I think I've ever seen in my life. The audience uh, will be glad it's uh, not just a solo project because you wouldn't want to listen to an album of me singing, I don't think. <laughs> so that was the thing. Uh, it was going to be kind of my project but I wanted to work with lots of singers. And the original idea was to work with people that I'd really enjoyed working with over the last 20 years, producing right. and recording their records, and also to kind of push out and see if I could work with people that I'd like to work with that I hadn't worked with before. Uh, so that's how it came about. The, obviously, working with some of the people that I'd worked with before gave me some confidence, uh, and uh, working with new people I had to just kind of Brave it so, and the first album, uh, Julie Fowlis and Karen Matheson were a big part of that, and I'd worked with them a lot, so it was quite nice to, to get them involved. Uh, and the first album, Paul Buchanan uh, very kindly agreed to record the title track, Starless, which is it was a song that Bobby Henry and I had written together for Karen Matheson's second right. so but we, we did a few tracks together for that but that one didn't make it uh, and I think I tried different people in that song but I think after a while I realised it, it should have been a male vocal rather than a female vocal right. and I was thinking to myself who would I like if I had a kind of open book to ask people in Scotland singers who would I like and I thought well the one singer would be Paul Buchanan uh, and so I got in touch with his management and uh, heard nothing back. <laughs> uh, and three months went by and I thought, I'm going to have another bash at that. And uh, my brother-in-law, Mark Wilson, was at school with him the year oh, below. Nice. And I said, well, you know, Paul. And he said, yeah. I said, can you give me his number? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, they'll get in touch. And, uh, and then the next day, Paul began phoned me. And I thought, wow, that was quite. But that's not why he had phoned. Mark hadn't been in touch. It was Craig Armstrong who was talking about me. And uh, Paul phoned me and we, we get talking. And so he agreed to do the song. So that was great. You know, that was a big thing for me. Being a fan of the Blue Nile and Paul's fantastic vocals and so forth. And I must admit, it was really handy because that was the first track I recorded. Right, yeah. So then I could say to everyone else, oh yeah, Paul Buchanan's doing this. <laughs> It's quite a calling card to be able to... But it made it a wee bit easier. That's not the reason I asked him, of course, but it did make it a wee bit easier getting other people on. So so how did you choose the singers that... Because you, you should say that um, 
the you I'm presuming have got the music together and then you've asked various singers to come on and yeah. take part. So how did you once you've got Paul Buchanan in place, how did you then go about choosing who, who else to approach? Well, I'd asked Julie way before that. Uh, I think Julie was one of the first people I, I asked. But for example, Julie said, oh, yeah, I'll do that in January. We, I asked her in January and then she sang on the record the, in October. You know, she's so busy and she had one day off and she was very kind to give me a part of that day. So I always knew I was going to ask Julie. I always knew I was going to ask Karen because I'd worked with them before. And then uh, Marie Claire Lee had not worked with, but she'd sung some guide vocals and songs that Bobby and I had written years before. And I sifted through 10 years of emails until I found her. <laughs> I've had that before and I know exactly what that's like. We got in touch and, you know, it was just d different kind of uh, Kayla Roan. She, she was in a, a band that James McIntosh and her had that I'd loved but their material never came out. Right. So Apocalypse was one of her songs that we did a demo of again a long time ago. So I approached her and, and worked out. So I had a lot of backing tracks and ideas and stuff and I'd see who I thought would match the songs. And then unusually for me, there was a track called Misty Nights that I, I suffer from insomnia from time to time. Mm -hmm. and I tend to get up and come in here and play about the studio. And I came in one morning, I had a whole track within a few hours even a kind of vocal melody line in some words, which I don't do that often, and I even recorded a wee bit of a vocal, which no one's ever heard, thankfully. <laughs> uh, but, and I was playing it to my wife, except the vocal, and she said, do you know who you should ask to sing that, Chris Thompson? And I thought, Jesus, I hadn't thought of that. So that was Adrian's, my wife's uh, suggestion, and Chris and I hadn't been, we hadn't recorded together for well, 30 years, you know, so, and I sent him the track and he, he wrote the, the lyrics, kept a couple of things I had, and wrote the melody, and it just, actually it was quite emotional hearing it, you know, because it, it references an old Friends Again song in a period that Chris and I had in our youth, so it was a really nice thing. So that was Adrian's suggestion, and now Chris and I are working together quite a lot. So because you should say that uh, yourself and Chris uh, formed the band Friends Again, are, you know, and yeah, we were at school. Very, it was a, very early eighties. Yeah, well, we had a, we had a couple of variations on that band before it became Friends Again. Really dreadful names. Although I still think Friends Again is a pretty dreadful name as well. <laughs> but so we had a couple. Of, so we started that at school. Uh, it came around. Uh, I'd been in a music shop in Hamilton, uh, looking at mini moogs that, of course, no one could afford. Yeah. And, um, to play and I met Chris in the main street he had a collection of Bowie albums so he just got a job summer job from school working on the roads building the M8 as it was wow. and, uh, his first wage packet he just bought all the vinyl of Bowie that he didn't have so we get talking about music and we said let's start a band you know he could play and had an instrument I couldn't but I bought a synthesizer so that was it <laughs> Well, it's how lovely to be able to be working again with him all those years later. Yeah, it's been, it's been really, obviously, Chris had the bathers, but again, bathers hadn't done really any recording in for like 15 years. Yeah, for so a while, yeah. It was good. It, it was really good fun getting back together. It came, I wouldn't say it, was, it came easily, but it, it worked well and it was, you know, we kind of worked quite well together. And uh, it's been good, and Chris is doing a lot of the Baylor stuff again now as well. Yeah, which yeah. It's great, yeah. So, very positive. So, maybe we should name some of the other, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but some of the other collaborators that you've been involved with. Because there's some amazing names. What I have to say is the, you know, you're talking about thinking of singers that fit the songs. And in every single example, it seems to me that the singer fits the song. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of, I thought about that. A lot, I think, and I've just, I've just sent out some tracks over the, the last couple of days for the next record to a couple of people, and I'm thinking, I'm, I've got ideas for tracks. We'll just have to see how they, they go. But yeah, it was the same with uh, on the new album on Earthbound with uh, Jerry Burns. You know, I sent her two, things. and one we we ended up not using. She had a wee idea for, and she came over here to the studio. 
And she said, look, I've got this other thing for that track. And then we just did it there and then. It was great. So, uh, and, and Jerry thought, she she wasn't going to sing it at first because she thought she hadn't got a song structure like verse chorus verse chorus kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it's a, I'm trying to remember what the call the track's called glittering light, and I said no, I like it that way. It's, it doesn't need to be. I said there's enough structures in the, the record. It's good when there's something that's slightly different, and I think Jerry's got that approach where she she'll bring something different, which is it's good, you know. So. So I'm really pleased with her track. It's one of my favourites at the moment, I think. So, and yeah. did you have it in your mind as well that these songs were going to be uh, done live? Because I was lucky enough to see a uh, previous live gig at the Mitchell, which was an amazing wow. night. Thanks. But the, the, you know, everyone you knew could really sing. So was that in the back of your mind? Yeah. So you have to be able to do this live when it comes to it. Well, I, 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 no, I, had, I must admit, I hadn't thought of it live at all. Or were you just doing, picking really good singers and it just so happened that that's what Picking happened. really good singers and people, yeah. really good singers, but people that had a particular character and so forth. Yeah. When you think of it, Paul Buchanan, Karen Mathis and Julie Fowles, you know, it's it's not a bad start. Like it's Chris. Not, it's and, not. and then I've got, you know, Graeme Skinner on the new record on Earthbound and I mean, Graham's voice hasn't changed. Yeah, you know, it's 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 superb. You know, and Emma Pollock, of course, that was really exciting for me in this record. Uh, again, I know Emma, not you know, I don't know her that well. I know her through herself and Paul in the studio, and how that came about was it Stuart uh, Crookshank's event down at the oh, I'm trying, I can't remember the name of the event. It doesn't matter. But she was performing with Rab, Rab Noakes and she was yeah. doing this song. And I just thought, I hadn't seen her live or anything. I just, I knew her records and I thought, yeah. wow, that was brilliant. So after I went up and said, I'm going to sing my next record. <laughs> uh, and so I went over to the house and we had a chat and we played through some of the ideas and what the record was about and all that. And uh, she said, yeah. So I just had this idea for the a track that's now called Paper and I sent her over the track. Uh, and she didn't do anything for a wee while, and then she sent me it about a month later, and she said, I haven't had time to finish it, but this is an idea. And I thought, oh, that's great, I loved it. You know, just her voice was brilliant. And there was something for me that was really, what she'd done, I'd sent her a backing track, mm -hmm. and she just sang into a laptop and garage band at home. And I thought, that's, it just, I really loved it. So then we worked on the track, rearranged it slightly, went into her studio, Chem 19, and we redid the vocal, which was brilliant, but it was something I really liked about the vocal. She just recorded in her laptop. So on the record, the verse is Emma singing in her kitchen on the laptop, and then the right. chorus is in the studio. And I used some technology to remove reverbs and stuff like that, but it was just something about the performance and her voice, which is amazing. So I was really excited about that. So the, if, if people haven't heard this, they might think, well, it's um, different singers with a... It's a mishmash. <laughs> no, no, what I mean is, we're not really getting over how lush it can be, how epic it can be. The I mean, the, let's talk about the production of it, you know, because, uh, you know, there's orchestration on there as well, isn't there? Well, the production is where it came from. So I suppose, you know, in Friends Again, I was a piano player, a keyboard player. Love money that you know is keyboard player, but I suppose uh, what got me interested in music when I was a kid, I just listened to music constantly. But when I became a teenager, what interested me was sound, it wasn't necessarily just the song, you know, I, I was interested in sounds, and that's what really got me. When I was 15, I wanted to be a record producer and own a studio, but of course, that didn't. That wasn't the way my career went, but that's what I was interested in. So when I came to make these records, that's what the initial idea was about. It was about a producer making a record, and that's you know that was my role in it. And as it's developed and becoming, you know, I'm performing more on them and so forth. The first one's a lot of programs. Second one's a bit more piano. Third one will be some more guitar based stuff. But uh, it's all really about the production, song production. And the singers. And like in this record, when I broached Stephen Lindsay, 
I said, look, I've always really loved this song, your song, Breakdown. I wouldn't mind the version. He said, oh, who are you going to get to sing it? And I was like, how are you going to do it? <laughs> he said, so, you know, I was just thinking, I'd like to do this. And then we wrote a song together somewhere in the night, and that was great fun to do as well, because he's a really good writer and great voice. So, you know, at first I think Stephen thought, well, that was odd because I've already done that song. I said, yeah, no, but let's, let's try to see what happened, what happened, you know. And I think that's one of the things we are, where we are with technology and production now is you can try things in a home studio like this, and, you know. And if they don't work, it's no big move on to the next thing. Well, that song's a good maybe example of, of how you're approaching it because, as you say, uh, Stephen had released it on his own album, uh, so how did you think I'm going to, because it's recognisably the same song, and as you said, still singing it, so how did you think I'm going to approach making my imprint on it? Uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, it, is very, it, it is the same structure, it's the same voice, it, it's just, the production's slightly different, I think. Yeah. You know, the, if if anything, I would if I had to comment on it myself, I would say it's slightly more poppy in a sense. You know, it's maybe just slightly more immediate. I don't know, but uh, I just love his voice, and it's just something. There was someone else that I had in mind. If he didn't want to do it, that would have asked. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just fancied working with him, and I thought that was a really good way. Of I, I first heard Stephen sing at the sub club opening. The night the sub club in Glasgow opened, yeah. Love and Money, Stephen Lindsay, and I'm trying to remember Bobsy Mullins' band's name. Uh, it's escaped me for a moment. Yeah. But uh, the three of us played, and that was the first time I heard him sing. I thought, what a, what a great voice. And we just, you know, our paths crossed, but we never worked together. So I thought, well, that's, that's a good way of starting and then see, see where we go. So, and hopefully we'll do some more work together. So is this project for you, offer that opportunity to maybe work with people you've always wanted to, discover yeah. new people, yeah. but also make connections with people that yeah. maybe you haven't seen for a while. Exactly, that, that, that is partly that. And I've, I must admit, I've asked a couple of singers that I haven't managed to work with, and there's a, a couple that I haven't managed to get to yet, and I'm still trying to. So we'll see what happens for the next one. Yeah, a lot of the same people will be involved in the next one, hopefully some new people and so forth as well. So, Because everything I've heard so far over the couple albums, mm -hmm. there is a sound that goes through it, um, which I guess is, is all down to your production and how you can... Well, it is intentional. It's, uh, I've always thought of it as being, a, it sounds very happy, but so what? A trilogy, it's a three, three album. Oh, kind right, of okay. So it's, it's a theme, you know, so... The next one, I know where I'm going with the next one. There is a change, I mean, they're very, very similar, the first and second, but there is a change of mood slightly, and there will be in the third one again. The first one, I, I know this, this sounds a bit silly, but I intentionally didn't use real instrumentation except the orchestra. It's yeah. all programming, it's all electronic. Second one, I've played far more piano on it than I had done in a long time. And the third one, as I say, there'll be a bit more guitar than the second one. So I've got kind of, it's still held together in the same way. It'll be, the third one will be multi-vocalist. Some of it will be orchestrated as well. And I think that's one of the things from a production point of view and writing point of view, that when you've got so many different singers and different kind of things, it would be very easy for it to be disparate. Yes. As a record. And that was one of the things that the orchestration was doing, was trying to hold that together and have a theme through. There's other themes, but have a, a sonic theme, theme through there. Yeah, yeah, it's something that you managed to pull off because you do, as you say, these singers, they're not just great singers, they're strong personalities in their own right. Mm -hmm. And with some of them, well known. You know, if you listen yeah. to a Paul Buchanan or a Chris Thompson vocal or yeah. a Karen Matheson vocal, you kind of immediately know who it is. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, as you say, it maybe does sound as though it, it's got the potential to be disparate, but your sound kind of, you know, carries it through through the whole thing. Yeah, and there's a wee bit of that in the kind of, and you know, in the running order and the pacing of it and so forth to make the tracks work within the context of the different vocalists and so forth. But it's interesting as well because you know, 
you and I know who the people are and so forth. But in the first record, like Chris Drever does a backing vocal and everyone thinks that's Paul Buchanan. Yeah. And then, you know, some people think Chris is Paul Buchanan. So, it's, so there's wee similar, similarities in the voices, although they're distinct. But there's wee bits that's quite interesting. That different people pick up and things. You think, oh, that's quite interesting. I hadn't noticed that. But uh, Chris Drever, another great vocalist, you know, what a great voice he is. So oh, absolutely fantastic. Hopefully, we've, I've asked Chris to do some, we haven't done it yet, but hopefully that'll happen, you know, just, he's, got, well, he's amazing as well. There's, there's so many great singers that, you know, you could work with, you could, you could do hundreds of albums. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? I started when I was younger. <laughs> So, how has it been trying to release a record and, you know, I suppose promote a record when it's such a kind of unique situation at the moment? Nobody's yeah. nobody can see you live, but there's also other problems. Well, it's it's been, I must admit, it's been odd. So, we had a concert scheduled again at the Mitchell, and that was for, I think that was the 15th of May, and then that was put back to October, and now it's the 29th of May next year. So, for me, it's slightly odd, and that could be partly my background, my history, and my age. So everything's online, that's fine. But I still like, you know, if you could walk down Glasgow <laughs> Main Street a couple of weeks ago, I still like posters, I still like flyers, yeah. as well as everything online. One of the big things for me is seeing vinyl in a record store. But again, that's just, that's me that's my age and so forth but it's a big thing for me i want to see my records in a store I, you know everything online is fantastic but i miss a wee bit of that i must admit you know because for, for the first alice album we had street posters we had all the kind of old traditional kind of yeah ways of advertising as well as everything online it's been great working with last night from glasgow you know they're working really hard through all of this and doing a lot of good uh, work uh, the isolation album that's coming out you know raising money for people to, for venues and stuff that's been really really positive but it's been it's been as good as it can be i think but there is this social interaction and meeting people and like be, the records being in a store and all that that hopefully we'll be able to do that when it you know we get moving again but i have missed that a, a, a bit you know yeah because talking about the kind of physical things both albums and actually the whole look of the project, you know, the lovely kind of lush black and white posters. I mean, I've got a copy here. See, you got this lovely gatefold yeah. sleeve. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's really stylish and it's a really beautiful thing. And it sounds that, and I know that's important to last night from Glasgow, but even on the, other, the previous album, it seemed yeah. to be there was a, a way that things were going to look as well as uh, yeah. sound. There, there definitely was. I mean, it was one of the interesting things because. The first album came out in Marina Records, who yes. I've got a, a fantastic history of releasing Scottish music. I mean, the release albums I've been involved in with Cowboy Mouth, uh, Sugar Town, and various other things I've produced as well as we've performed in. And they've just got a great history, and their artwork's always brilliant, you know, they work really hard. But for this, for the Starless record, I had a, an idea of how I wanted it to look and everything. So I finished it before I sent it to them. And I thought Marina might not be interested in it because I've already got the artwork. And that's a big thing for them doing the artwork, they do all the design. But I worked with Kenny Lawson on the, the album. He did the Scottish uh, designer, lives in London. He did the, the artwork. And we, I was introduced to him by a friend. and. We got to talking on the phone and we spoke for about two, two and a half hours just about music and had a lot in common and I told him I, some ideas and we went from there. Uh, and that worked out, his ideas were great for the, for the first album. So I wanted to go back to him for the second album and I will do for the third as well and keep those themes going, you know, because there are themes that I just want to keep going through you know, the records. Yeah. So it's been, you know, it's been really nice having someone that's quite dedicated to the design. And, you know, we talked about those kind of classic gatefold sleeves for this one. And, you know, you used to spend hours looking over and still go back and look, you know, that's that's what I was wanting to, to try well, and do. I was talking to my brother about exactly that, about how we, the importance of having something that you sit down 
and listen to it has now become a really big thing again. He said, yes, the technology changed and you could shuffle and you could skip and you could do all those yeah. things. But actually, and you've said how important it was to sequence the songs in a way that was important to you. And mm -hmm. really, it almost is the job of the listener to sit down and respect that, I think. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people are. It's taking the time to listen to a record, you know, and I think a lot of people are doing that. Uh, certainly, with doing the first record, I found it difficult because I thought, well, how does it work on Spotify? How does it work in iTunes? All these things, because it's all segue. If you've heard the first album, you know, it's just one thing that all joins together. The second one does that as well, and you're just like, well, how do I make that work? But you just, I think you have to make the record and then figure it out from there. Other people can figure it out if they want to play individual tracks. I think that's probably right, yeah. Um, you so mentioned it's, for me, it's been interesting. In this one, I'm trying to remember the title of the track. I can't. There's a wee instrumental between. It's the end of Ch Chase the Devil, I think. Uh, it in in Gaelic, is it? Yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah, Angel or something like yeah. that. Excuse my pronunciation. It's going to be just again. It was just going to be the end of that track, and then I thought, oh, I'll make it. I'll put an I didn't make its own track, but it's so short it doesn't even count as plays on Spotify. You know, it's, you know there's been a couple of to think about before. It's just, but I don't. You know, you just you want to. It's just a wee incidental piece of music that that I like, and that's for that's from a film that uh, James Grant and I did music for that never get used, and it's always a wee thing that I like. And I just thought, oh, that fits with that piece of music. So, so sometimes I'm visiting archives things. On the, on the new album, Earthbound, Chris Thompson and I wrote, we get a song called Calvary. I think we wrote it in 1980. Right, wow. Yeah, the record. So, and it's a track that I always liked, you know, and uh, it's quite geeky. In fact, here we go. <laughs> Chris I and Neil from Friends Again clubbed in our pocket money to build wow. a machine in 1980. <laughs> so it was a kit from an electronics magazine. And we wrote the song around this drum machine. And it just it came to mind one day. And I thought, I'm going to rework that. And so Chris and I reworked it. Really pleased with how it turned out. So, so it's been kicking about since 1980. <laughs> You mentioned, you mentioned films there, and I didn't realise till I did a bit of research that you've worked on a few films, a couple of yeah. favourite Scottish films of mine, like American Cousins and The Near Room. Uh -huh. How do you approach that as, a, as a, a piece of work? Well, The Near Room was an interesting one because uh, James was f friendly with the, the writer of the film. They played football together. Right. I think James pestered them and said, let me do the score, <laughs> you know? And after a bit of pestering, uh, we met David Heyman. So James and I did it together. I mean, James was the main composer on it, but we worked on it together and we just did it in Mammy's studio and we had to learn how to do everything because we hadn't done it before. And it's quite different from now. There was no, I mean, Pro Tools had just come out, so computer technology was really in its infancy. So we had right. to learn an awful lot. But we worked on it from script up, so we were involved right from the first, the, the day that it started. We worked on it for, I think, three months or something. So it was a great learning experience. And then, I, I, I mean, I wrote a lot of stuff for TV and uh, cooking programmes and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, fun. And uh, you mentioned, Ella, that you, your musical career, a lot of it was spent in Love and Money. Um, yes. so how has uh, the music side of things, the business side of things, for want of a better word, has it changed? I mean, it used to be the, the idea that to be a success you had to leave Scotland, but I don't think you guys really did, did you? Well, I don't suppose we, 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 we didn't. We, all, we always lived in Scotland, except, you know, when we were working away from home. Yeah. You know, when we were friends again, there was always that kind of big thing, or oh, we need to go to, to London. But again, we all lived at home, and you know, you'd live in London for months on end. But love and money, it was, it was interesting because we were signed to Phonogram Records. So at that point, big country, love and money, Texas, then Hipsway, or Hipsway, then Texas, sorry. 
uh, bluebells were signed to London, who were another part of phone. You would be down in the record label in the mid eighties, and it was like being sub club. You know, it's just like <laughs> wet, wet, wet. Of course, you know, all these bands were signed to the same labels, so it was just like you'd see your the guys you know, in the pub one night and then in the record company the next. So you didn't feel the need because it was a, an onslaught. And you, you remember yourself that the mid eighties, early eighties, mid eighties in Glasgow, the record companies, the a &R guys left here because they were scared to miss something. And every city has its time, you know, and that, that was one of Glasgow's times. Glasgow's had other times as well, but certainly that early eighties period, the a &R guys were just here all the time trying to you know, sign bands. So, there was that kind of wee bit of camaraderie that you didn't feel that you were alone and, you know, so we could work. And then we had Stuart Clumpus manage Love Money halfway through and he was a good businessman and so forth. So suppose in that sense we didn't feel the need, you know? Yeah, so if it was one of these... And this is changing all the time. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very different now from what it was then. And, you know, there is that, that, it's interesting because we were talking about it a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about Spotify thing and how it's difficult for artists to, to make income from that. But then I thought about it and now I've had a, a, a very fortunate career in the music industry, I've been very lucky, but I thought about it, I don't think I've ever made a penny from making a record. Right, ever. that's interesting, isn't it? You know, so you, so I can look at Spotify and say, well, I get point zero zero one of a pence for a play of a, a Star Wars track. Don't know if I've ever had a penny for a Love and Money track. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, you know, and we sold, you know, quarter million records or whatever. So it's just a different way. <laughs> and I'm not saying it's a good thing. You know, no. I'm just, you know, I have had a very fortunate career and it worked in one particular way. Right. I think it's. I think what it is, it's it's so difficult for young artists to get a break. Yeah. You know, and we, I think Love Money were very fortunate. We had a record company finances for ten years. Sure. That's a long time, you know. So, so you know, we 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 lived comfortably for ten years making the records we wanted to make. That 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 is in itself a very fortunate position to get up as a musician and be able to do what you want to do musically without having to do another job or anything like that. That is a very fortunate position to be in. And I think we were very lucky to, to be part of that time. And you know, you're, you're sitting in your, your studio there and that seems to be something else which has changed is that there's now the technology for people to make and produce records. Um, I mean, they might not all have a, a set up like yours, but you know, people <laughs> can do uh, these things much more easily now. Yes, well, that's it. I mean, technology, well, here we are using Zoom to, to yeah. have this conversation. I mean, that's the thing. For, for Starless, if I didn't have a home studio, I couldn't do it. Yeah. You know, it's, you could do, so, I do so much in the laptop, I do so much in here, go to record the orchestra where we go, some of the vocalists will do stuff at home, some will come here, I might go and hire a studio. There's lots of flexibility. But to do a record like a Starless record, if I did that at the same time as we did an album, uh, Strange Kind of Love, 1987, Love and Money record, that album cost a quarter of a million dollars to make. And then that sounds ridiculous, I know that, it took a year. But the Starless projects, I couldn't afford to do unless the technology was where it is nowadays. It lends you, I mean, it's still quite expensive to do, but it lends you the opportunity, you know, you can do a, a great record on a la laptop. If you've got an idea, you've got a way of capturing it. Then I think that's that's the thing. I think that's one of the. I suppose that's one of the things that's great, and also maybe makes it difficult. If you've got a laptop and an idea or whatever it is you're doing, you can capture something that's great, but also means hundreds of people are capturing something. So there's a lot of material out there. There might be some amazing material that you might never get to hear because there's so much. Yeah. But but the technology is empowering. I think. Yeah. Well. Paul, thanks very much for talking to us today. I really hope that we'll get to see and hear Earthbound live sooner rather than later. And it sounds like it's scheduled to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although I'm saying that, 
I'm saying that just now, and then when it comes to actually organising it, I'll be like, the, oh, why did I see him do this? <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, the live, it must take some organising to do those live shows. We, the one we did at uh, Mitchell took a wee bit of my, it shortened my life, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but once it was over, it was good fun. <laughs> yeah, I think we've all organised things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, everyone, everyone was great. I must admit, all the singers were fantastic and so forth. And you know, Greg Lawson, you know, the players were. It was a, it was a great night. It was, I mean, it was stressful putting it together, but it was a great night. And I'm glad we did it. So hopefully, we'll get the next one. And um, well, from. Uh, yeah. From someone who was in the audience, your stress was all worth it for me. <laughs> well, the, the audience were very kind, I must say. So, so that's good. It's a great new place, though, that, that theatre. It's a, it's yeah, a great it place. is. I've seen some really great stuff there. I think it's kind of underused. Um, yeah, is, so, thanks again. Thank it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. You too. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. Mm -hmm.